We All are. Right. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the twelfth Big East Coast podcast. Um, last year, this was known as the Monday Takeaway, but I think we're just going to stick with the name that we have already. Yep. Um. Anyway, that's Chris. I am Rob, as always. Um, basketball started. That's pretty cool. Um, Big East uh, is 10-0 and 0 as we speak here. Yep. Monday afternoon um, with nine different teams having wins. Uh, Providence hasn't played yet. They'll play later today. Um, yeah. So, really, if we want to just jump right in here to recap the opening weekend, not a ton of surprises. I mean, everyone won, everyone that should have won. I think there was one big surprise in how much a team beat another team by. Yeah, I, I believe you were probably talking about Marquette, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, um, Marquette, of course, taking care of business on Friday night against Vanderbilt in the Armed Forces Classic out in Annapolis. Uh, Golden Eagles won 95-71. to 71. A very impressive victory across the board, really. Uh, a, lot, a lot of standouts. Sam Hauser, especially, who won Big East Freshman of the Week, week so to speak, after a 14-point uh, performance in which he, the freshman went 5-4-8 from the field, including 4-7 from three which was quite impressive for the youngster. Marquette as a whole shot 41% from the three-point line on 31 attempts, which is a good sign, even if it is just, you know, one game. It's nice to see the Golden Eagles were able to – or might have, you know, some good players out on the perimeter this year. That will certainly help them, considering that's what they need with only one player who can go down low and score efficiently in Luke Fisher. Yeah, uh, that was definitely a very positive performance, all things considered, for Marquette to start the season. Yeah, they were down by one going into the half, and uh, you know they won by twenty-four. Yeah, that's a plus twenty-five in the second half. Yeah, um, so that's big. And you know, if you go by Ken Palm, bring it down by quarters from the start of the second half to the ten-minute mark, Marquette went on a twenty-six to six run. Yeah. So the fact that they were able to pull something like that off is, you know, quite impressive for a team that, you know, last year while they did have Henry Ellenson, uh, they weren't, you know, great offensively, I would say. They would say that they were more average, if anything, and not very good from, you know, the perimeter either. They only had a three-point percentage of 33.9, which ranked 210th in the country. Yeah, and I mean, the other day on the national preview, uh, both you and Jeff – kind of talked about Vandy's bigs, and I thought they would give Marquette's bigs, you know, more game because, you know, outside of Luke Fisher, Marquette's pretty not great sized, and uh, they didn't really do much. I mean, Jeff Roberson had 10 rebounds and 9 points, but it was pretty quiet. Uh, you know, Luke Cornette had 15. It was pretty quiet. Yeah, I mean, they, they out-rebounded them, too, by two, yeah. no less, but they I, still have rebounded. I think a big thing for Vandy is they're going to miss Wade Baldwin. And I, that's not a surprise. I mean, his lottery was, did he end up in the lottery? He was a. Uh, uh, I think he was only first. Yeah, I, mean, I don't he was remember not either way. And uh, you know, you could see they struggled to protect the ball. You know, they Marquette got nineteen turnovers off of him. And uh, you know, it's Vanderbilt's first game with a new coach, but this was a game. This is one of the games where you know this one, and then one of the two K Classic ones that we'll talk about in a little bit. Marquette needed to win two of those. Yes. You know, that's not counting Georgia and Wisconsin. Yeah, exactly. It's a good start. Yeah, it's, it certainly was, and like you had mentioned, they needed to get these kinds of wins to, you know, boost their profile a little bit. Vanderbilt obviously might struggle without Baldwin and Damian Jones as well, but it still was promising to see them club another, you know, high major team in the way that they did. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Marquette plays Howard tonight, and – should be 2-0 and by the end of the night, barring something catastrophic. Yeah. Um, I think Marquette got some top 25 votes, too, if I remember correctly. I know six Big East teams did. Yeah, I, I believe they were – I think I saw somewhere where it said that they received seven votes, on, I think. Yeah. Or something. I know St. John's, DePaul – or, yeah, St. John's, DePaul, Providence, and 
one other school didn't. Um, yeah. I'm trying to figure that school out in my head right now. Um, Creighton? No, Creighton did. I don't... Who was the... I gotta go back and find the tweet now. Here we go. Um, Villanova, Xavier, Creighton, Butler, Marquette, Seton Hall all received votes. So Georgetown didn't yet, which I think they're the next team we could talk about because they came out looking better on offense than we've seen them in I don't know when. Yeah, certainly Rodney Pryor lived up to expectations. Pryor was named the Big East Player of the Week or Weekend uh, after scoring 32 points while shooting 13 for 16 from the field, I believe it was. Uh, he certainly looked as advertised. Georgetown on the whole scored 105 points. It's the first time that they've hit 105 or more since 2007, I believe it was. Um, in game, they won over Radford. They did it in overtime against Missouri a few years ago. But um, yeah. in terms of regulation, yeah, the game against Radford, ironically. Yeah. So, and they beat up on USC Upstate uh, as a whole. Georgetown forced 26 turnovers. USC Upstate couldn't handle the ball at all. Uh, Georgetown was able to score off those turnovers in, in an efficient manner. Five players were in double figures. You know, across the board, you have to. You also have to like what you saw from Georgetown. Even you know, context is important with the opponent and whatnot. But still, uh huh. Yeah, and I mean, they shot. They shot the ball incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, you know, Pryor shot it very well. Um, Isaac Copeland was three for three. LJ Peak was four for five. Uh, you know, as a team, just in terms of two pointers, you know, 27 for 37, and then three pointers, nine for 17. So, you know, you average that out pretty good. Yeah. And obviously, last year, Georgetown, they didn't really, I wouldn't say that their main problem was offense. I mean, they were. They were, they were pretty good, all things considered, but their main issue a lot of times was, def was defense, and, you know, their defense, if they're going to run, you know, this pressure defense that they're doing right now and be able to score off turnovers. Yeah. And, That's another thing, full-court press for most of the first half. Exactly. A little bit of 40 minutes of hell type of action. Yep. Which was cool. Um, it was, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see if that continues on. Uh, I think it certainly could be implemented against Maryland. Yep. Which yeah, Maryland, Maryland struggled pretty hard against American. Yeah, they did. Um, and, you know, I saw someone tweet during the Georgetown game um, that uh, – hold on. That, uh, you know, maybe the offense looks better because DSR tried to do a little bit too much last year, which it, it's possible. I mean, especially when they were struggling. Yeah, it, it definitely is possible, and, you know, his absence will – you know, you can't really replace a player like that, but you, it'll certainly lighten up the burden on everyone else and give everyone else their own sh fair share of responsibility to, you know, take on the onus of scoring and being able to run whatever offense that they decide to do. And if it's going to be this, you know, free-flowing, and if they're able to attack efficiently, then Georgetown's going to give some teams some problems. Yeah, and, you know, we'll get into it later, but suddenly Georgetown, Maryland looks a lot more appealing. There are, about, there are at least five Gavit games that I'm excited for after not really being too into it all off season. I definitely would agree. And, you know, we'll get to those um, when the time comes. And actually, at this rate, Georgetown, Oregon is going to be a fun game. Yes, I would agree with that as well. Um, I believe they're still without Bradley Hayes. Was that four game or three game? Uh, I believe I think it would it was either three or four. I don't I don't really remember. I want to say four. Because if it's four, I mean Chris Boucher is gonna do some stuff. But uh, you know we'll we'll get to that next week. That's next Monday already. That uh, the Maui Invitational is set to kick off. Uh, so these tournaments are coming fast. Uh, you know with the Gavit games being in there, it was boom boom boom. Um, there's not much to talk about about Villanova. Yeah, you know, they were up twenty-five to two at one point. I think Jalen Brunson had one of the better games of his career. Um, you know, just affecting the ball, offense, defense, got some rebounds, and uh, so yeah. I mean, not not a ton to talk about with Villanova. Obviously, their game tonight is very interesting against Purdue, uh, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. 
Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that at length in a little bit. Yeah, because that that is suddenly one of the more intriguing games too. Um, let's see. Any other? I Creighton, you know, it's easy to discount them and say they got complacent or whatever, but the only reason they were able to get complacent is because they were out to such a big lead. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you got to take that into account. You know, it's not something you want as a trend, but it's okay. I wouldn't worry too much about Creighton. Um, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about Xavier either, even though they, they did struggle with Lehigh, but Lehigh is probably the best team in the Patriot League right now. So I don't think it's close. And uh, Tim Kempton is one of the better bigs in the country. Yeah, and I know Clay, our right, one of our writers, had predicted a big game for him because of you know Xavier's lack of bigs down low. And certainly he, he did prove to do that. So if that continues to be an issue, then, you know, as as we said on the, their preview podcast, they could run into some trouble. Even if, you know, Sumner and Blewett and Makura are all effective, uh, they could run into yeah. some well, trouble. You know, they did what we thought they were going to do. They got 58% of their points from Makura and Blewett, who I, or uh, Sumner and Blewett, who I believe both set career highs. I know Blewett did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, Lehigh's a good team. It's, and they started slow last year, too, against a team that wasn't quite as good in Miami, Ohio. You know, Buffalo's a good team, too. And they play Buffalo tonight. Yeah. Uh, you know, Missouri is not a good team. So. Yeah, so if, if they struggle with Missouri, then, you know, maybe we can start being super worried. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if I would, because, you know, Missouri, they, they hung with them last year a little bit. I mean. But that, that, was that game at Sintas or was that in Columbia? That was uh, at Sintas. Oh, okay. Well. But, no, I mean, I'm, I, I think they'll be fine. Obviously, you know, the bigs are going to be an issue, and they just got to get out there and get experience. I mean, that's what it, that would, that's what it was all off season. Certainly. And – I think a, a team we could also, you know, jump through as we're kind of just bouncing around the league right now. A team that certainly impressed me a little bit, a team that could get, give Xavier fits with their issues down low was Seton Hall, the only team right now that's 2-0 in the Big East, the only team that's played two games so far in the conference. Um, they had a very successful weekend in beating Fairleigh Dickinson and Central Connecticut. Um, you know, Angel Delgado, if he's going to keep playing like this, then he has he has an outside shot of being Big East Player of the Year because he's he's been dominant so far. Yeah, um, I think his numbers will probably even out a little bit. I don't think he's gonna average you know fifteen rebounds a game or whatever. That's true. But he has he has gotten now twenty five double doubles in his in his you know, short career so far. So yeah. And Seton Hall is uh, 20 and 5 when he gets a double double. And I think what another thing that also stuck out to me, and I talked about this in the uh, the recap yesterday, if Kadeem Carrington has, has developed a three point shot, then, you know, they're going to be even more problematic. I mean, he's so far, obviously, it's only through 10 attempts. You can't go too deep into it because he's not going to shoot 90% from three. No. But this is a guy who shot 28% from three his freshman year. And 33% last year. So even if he takes a jump up to 38 to 40%, you know, that's, that's going to help Seton Hall in a big way. Uh-huh. Because it'll give them a three point, a three, an effective three point shooter on a team that right now going into the year, didn't really have too many options on the outside, aside from Veer Singh, who, you know, right now he's not a starter. He's only going to be in complimentary roles. So, if they have a guy who's on the floor a lot in Kadeem Carrington who can shoot from the outside very well, then, you know, that's another thing that, that defenses need to worry about when playing the Pirates, and they already have to worry about, you know, Delgado down low, so they force all their attention to him. Well, if Kadeem Carrington is able to you know, shoot well from the outside, it, could, it just presents more problems for them. Exactly. Yeah. Um I think Butler had one of the more boring games. No offense to them. I mean, you know, they went out, did what they were going to do. 
Tyler Lewis played really well. Um, he did. He did. Which he played really well in the non-conference last year. You know, that's not his problem. His problem is going to be keeping this going in the conference play, which and I say this, you know, it's one game. But, you know, it's a good start. It was. It's, I think it was a good start for Martin, too, even though he was one for seven from three. That'll have to obviously change. But given his career so far, uh, I think it, there's reason to believe that it will. Uh-huh. Uh, shot 37% from three last year, which was a big leap from shooting only 25%, roughly 25% his freshman year. So I don't think that, you know, that's – Cause for concern, we need to wait things out there. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, you know, Butler did what they do. They took great care of the basketball. And, uh, you know, business as usual. Yeah, I think the main takeaway from that game for me was how the hell did we watch games in standard depth for so long? <laughs> yeah, I had to watch um, one of the – I think Xavier – because you know, it was on one of those regional channels that I didn't realize I'd get all of them. So that's actually a really nice bonus. But, uh, yeah, it was hard. It's it was hard. Standard definition television kind of stinks. Well, yeah, because, you know, you got this 50-inch TV or whatever, and it doesn't help. No, you know, it doesn't help. So I don't, I don't know how that happened for so long. I guess we just got used to it. Yeah, I guess uh, so. Who haven't we talked about yet? Didn't talk about St. John's, who had themselves a good start to the season as well. They hung 100 on Beth and Cookman. Oh, yeah, they, they played great. Marcus Levette looked good. Um, yeah. This mix and match thing that Chris Mullen's doing worked for, you know, one game. Um, he's going to have to keep doing it. There's probably not going to be defined positions, which is, which is kind of strange because St. John's has, like, the most guys that you could put at defined positions. I think, in theory, I think that, you know, right now he's probably just getting used to having, you know, a horde of talented players on the roster compared to what it looked like last year. So he's going to try and find the best matchups and best lineups for for him and all of his rotations and whatnot. So I think as the season wears on, I think positions will be more defined. I think you can probably expect Levette to eventually get in the starting lineup, but he's going to play like he did on Friday. On, uh, yeah, and I mean – you know, you got your two bigs in Yakwe and Sima. Those are probably going to be pretty constant in the lineups. Uh, you see, he looked great at the two. Um, another guy who made an impact on def- defensively was Tariq Owens, who had five blocks. Yeah. And yes. if he's getting five blocks, and you still have Yakwe and Sima, who combined for, I think, one or two blocks. I mean. That's that's a team that you might see give Seton Hall a run for their money. Yes. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know how well St. John's matches up with, you know, teams like Villanova or Xavier or teams, guard-heavy teams, just because their guards are good but not experienced. But I think when you get the battle of the bigs like that, you're going to see St. John's maybe surprise a couple people. I definitely would agree there. Definitely, and I think that they could, you know, if they have, have all those shot blockers down low with Villanova's lack of size, I think they could give them some fits. I think that, you know, Villanova's guards are just much better. But obviously that, that will come for another day, that discussion. Speaking of Villanova, are you concerned that they shot a million threes again, or is that just what they do at this point? It's what they do. I'm not concerned. They're probably going to do it tonight, just given the matchups too. I mean, you're not going to get the ball inside against Purdue. No, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's just, just, that's just their philosophy. I'm not concerned about that. I mean, it worked for the most part. They made probably 15, I think 15 of, you know, 36 or whatever. Yeah, they shot 36% from three, which, you know, whatever. It's not their best night, but I think that, you know, they can. Yeah. Do what they need to do. Um, yeah, so DePaul played an interesting game. A game that they legitimately led wire to wire, but it felt like they were going to not be leading for probably 35 of the 39 and a half minutes they led. Um, there were some good things. Uh, Eli came was good. I mean, he fouled out, but he was good. Uh, something you're probably not going to hear about anywhere except here or, you know, the one or two DePaul-specific sites out there. Trey Darius McCollum last night went uh, 12-8-6. Er, 
So, you know, he's kind of got that Mike Henry versatility early on. I mean, yeah. one game, but, you know, Mike Henry did so much for DePaul where if you can get McCollum to maybe give you, you know, half to three quarters of what Mike Henry did, you're going to be in good shape because I don't think Billy Garrett's going to go, you know, two for ten every night. No, I, I don't think I don't think so either. I think he's definitely a guy who's going to be who's going to you know work his shot out by, by you know even yeah. then, you know, I think he'll he'll probably do better than two for ten. Yeah, and uh, you know DePaul's got to figure their bigs out too. Uh, we knew that. Yeah, you know? that was the main concern going into this, into this year for them as far yeah. as you know, personnel goes. It's trial by fire. Um, you know, it's really all you can do. Yep. All right. Do we want to move on to uh, previews? Have we touched on every team? Uh, well, not Providence, but you know they'll be in the previews. Exactly. So yeah, I th- yeah I think we can definitely move on to the previews now. All right. So tonight, Monday night, um, obviously the biggest game on the schedule is Villain over Purdue. Um. I haven't looked at the AP poll in full, but I know Villanova's up to number three. Purdue was in the top 15 uh, last week, so they are 15 still. Okay. So, yeah, nice little matchup to start the year. Um, very tough to go into Mackey Arena and win. Uh, you have probably the best, one of the best, tandems of guards in the country against probably one of the best tandems of bigs in the country. Uh, it's going to be a good game. You know, and yeah, I think as a basketball fan, that's all you can really hope for. You know, uh, Purdue kind of rolled through McNeese State the other day. Uh, Caleb Swanigan, who is a guy that might be a problem tonight, 23-20 uh, and 20 against McNeese State. Um, I think the biggest question, how do you think Villanova is going to be able to stop Swanigan, or are they just going to let him do his thing and try and focus on stopping guys like Vince Edwards? Um. Well, I would probably expect them to probably throw Daryl Reynolds on him uh, and try to do their best to go from there to stop to stop them or at least stop the bleeding enough to where they won't fall too far behind based on what happens down low. You know, You know the problem with that, though, right off the bat is the other guy who isn't Vince Edwards who plays for Purdue in seven foot two Isaac Haas. Yes. So already, you know, Villanova doesn't have anyone within, you know, four inches of him. Exactly. So that's an issue. It could it could be an issue, yeah. So they might just have to, you know, implement their pressure their pressure defense as their main source of, you know at main course of action there. Just to make, just to ensure that you know they don't get into situations where they run how they want to do it, and they are able to get these sets and their possessions into into Swanigan or Haas's hand. Yeah, but on the other side, I don't think Purdue has anyone that can hang with you know Josh Hart or Jalen Brunson, especially not Jalen Brunson. I mean, their their smaller guards are not very good. No, um, not compared to Villanova, at least. Well, yeah, and you know we. We talked to Travis from Hammer and Rails, and he mentioned Brunson as a guy who is probably going to have a great night tonight. Yep. So, you know, it'll be interesting. Um, you know, that these are this is one of the games that's hard to predict. I mean, Purdue's taken not too many losses in Mackey in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, it's hard to go on the road and win. But this could be this could be a good game for Villanova, and I mean they obviously have experience in big games. Yeah, and they, that'll that'll certainly be helpful for them for this cause. And I think Villanova will pick up this win in a tight game, but it just it wouldn't shock me really if Purdue did wind up winning this game. And uh, I didn't actually realize that not everyone gets Big Ten Network. Nope. Because I mean I get it here, obviously. Um, but yeah, that, it's kind of strange why they ended up with this game and it didn't get switched over. I mean, I'm, I'm sure between FS1 and Big Ten Network, they kind of had like a draft of the games. 
Yeah, because I mean they they're both under the same umbrella. So yeah. I mean if this one has both of them tomorrow. Exactly. So you know, it's just it's just a shame that uh, you know, more people aren't gonna get to see this, but if you wanna watch this game hard enough, you'll find it. Yep. Um Xavier plays Buffalo. We talked about that a little bit already. Uh, Buffalo, very good team. Won the MAC last year. I believe they won the MAC the year before as well. They did. Um, you know, so they've they've been a pretty good team for a while. You know, obviously Bobby Hurley, very good coach there for a while. Nate Oates has kind of picked up right where Hurley left off. Um, I think Xavier's going to win, but it, like we said earlier, wouldn't surprise me to uh, see a little early struggle. You know, or you know they learn from Friday night and they're just going to come out gangbusters. I don't think there's really a middle ground here. You're not going to see you know an eight to ten point game the whole time. No, definitely not. And you know, even if they do wind up struggling again, remember last year they did go through similar early season struggles when they were trying to figure everything out. So it's not you know jump off the ledge territory yet. But yeah, like you said, Buffalo is a good team from you know a decent conference in the MAC. So yeah. it, it wouldn't shock me either if you know Buffalo gave them, gave them a game. And again, uh, you know Xavier's the best team in Port Orlando by far. Yep. Um, so, you know, they'll probably have some conference tournament dominance again. Get a nice afternoon game. Them and Villanova afternoon games on Thursday, so that'll be a lot of fun. Um, you know, Marquette plays Howard tonight. We talked about that. You know, that one is what it is. Um, St. John's against Binghamton. I don't think Binghamton has too many people that St. John's should worry about. Uh, you know, they went 8-22 and 22 last year. Always nice to pick up wins against the in-state schools, though. Yep, that should be that should be an easy victory for St. John's if they, you know, they play up to, to their par. Uh, Binghamton beat Cornell the other night, but, you know. That's not uh, one of the top teams in the America East. No. They're kind no. of middle, in the middle of the pack. They're not Vermont or Albany. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, what's the other big one tonight? Oh, yeah. Providence plays a pretty good Vermont team. Yeah, oh. from, aforementioned Cannabis, yeah. Um, this Vermont team, very good. In the top 100, Ken Palm, they took care of business against, um, I can never say it right, Quinnipack, not Quinnipack, Kinnipack. Yeah. Quinn Kinnipack um, in their opener. And, uh, you know, I think Providence is going to win. They, I believe, have only lost one non conference game under Ed Cooley at the Dunkin' Donuts Center. Yeah, I think that that sounds about right. Against Brown. Um, so, yeah, no, I think, I think Providence is going to win. Um, and then they go to uh, Columbus to play Ohio State, which will be. Very interesting because I still don't think Ohio State's all that good. No, so well, I mean they—they're you know they are what they are what they are. Yeah, and uh, we have the announcer pairings for tonight through Wednesday. Those will be up. Uh, obviously, the big game tonight: Villanova, Purdue. We got Brian Anderson. We're all very lucky for that. Yes. Um. And then tomorrow night, Georgetown, Maryland, you got uh, the first Gus and Raff Gus and Raff game of the year. Yeah, so that should be a lot of fun. They're bringing up the uh, big guns for that one. Yeah, yeah, and actually, Raff is working tomorrow through Thursday. Uh, haven't heard for sure about Friday yet, but Tim Brando tweeted that uh, he will be with Raff in uh, Hinkle and the Rosemont Horizon. Yep. And then FS1, I believe, has one. No, that's probably that's actually all four. So that's all we get for ref. Yeah, there are eight games, and yeah, um, don't have the Big Ten Network announcer pairings yet. Aside from tonight, those will come in. I think I saw that. Um, I want to say Seth Davis said he was going to be at Providence, Ohio State, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Huh? 
yeah. I mean, we'll find them. So, yep. um, like we talked about tomorrow night, one of the biggest uh, two-game slates for the Big East in a while, actually. Yeah, between Georgetown and Maryland and Wisconsin Creighton, it will definitely be nice, you know. A couple nice-looking wins to pick up there. Exactly. The opportunity is ripe there for, you know, some big success. Uh, I know Maryland won last year. Uh, it was very close. And it was in College Park. Uh, this year, Maryland is without Diamond Stone and Jake Lehman. I think they're without Diamond Stone. Yeah. yeah. He left. Yeah. Simon's gone. Jake Lehman's gone. So it's really – it's the Mellow Trimble show. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit like we talked about with um, Purdue Villanova where Maryland's got probably the advantage in the backcourt. Georgetown probably has the advantage in the front court. Um, Robert Carter leave too. Um, Is it just Trimble left? Yeah, so – oh, DeMonte Dodds there too. But yeah. They lost a lot from last year. So they did. I think on paper, they lose the advantage because Maryland really did not look great against American for a good portion of that game. No, definitely not. So it certainly you know looks a lot more comforting for Georgetown and their fan base when they go into this game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a Georgia team that's returning most of the players from last year. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily dialed into the magnitude of the rivalry. But, you know, obviously they can see quite plainly that it would be a big win. Yes, definitely. Um, especially going into the uncertainty of Maui, which is a very good field. But, you know, you get a little bit of – Get a little bit of momentum going your way. And uh, see what happens. Bingo. And then, yeah. So, Wisconsin traveling to a hostile environment um, in Omaha. Uh, obviously, we talked a lot about Wisconsin. You know a lot about them. They return everyone. Yep. Um it's going to be a tough game for Creighton. It's going to be one of Creighton's toughest home games in a while. And, I mean, I know they lost, you know, Arizona State or whatever, but that wasn't a tough game. They just played poorly. This is going to legitimately be you're playing a really good team. And uh, it's interesting. A lot of upperclassmen on these teams. Neither of them are too reliant on freshmen. No, not really at all. So it's you're going to see, you know – in theory, at least, you're going to see a lot of good, high-quality, smart basketball. Yeah, you know, you, you're not going to see a lot of uh, inexperienced youth in this game. There's going to be a lot of, you know, there's a big veteran presence on both teams. Um, so this this should be one of the more well-played games of the non-conference portion of this season and of the Gavit games in general, too. Yeah. I think when, it, when the schedule came out, this was definitely the one that everyone was talking about. Yes, absolutely. Everyone, I mean, everyone was kind of, you know, oh, why is going over playing Purdue? Eh. But Creighton, Wisconsin was like, oh, well, Wisconsin's returning everybody. That'll be a fun game when Creighton plays them. Yeah. And uh, Wisconsin, I don't know the last time they played a non-conference road game of this level. I mean, I know they went to Oklahoma last year. They went to Syracuse a year or two ago, I believe, also. I think it was actually last year, which wasn't oh. – not an awful – not an awful game. No. Yeah, so I think the Carry Dome's probably right up there. I would call both the Carry Dome and CenturyLink tougher places to play than um, Lloyd Noble. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think oh, they also they also played at Virginia three years ago, and well, that was yeah. really good. They went to the O'Connell Center, uh, um, Florida, back in 2012. That Florida team was, you know, really good too. So, so basically, I know we got a question about Creighton, Wisconsin that we'll get to later. You know, Nigel Hayes is going to be on the court for most of the game. Um, he's going to be a pest. 
Yes. That's just, that's what he does. Um, there's no real way to game plan to stop him. I mean, he does a lot of things real well. One of the best upperclassmen in the country. Absolutely, and Bronson Koenig is up there as well. Uh, his teammate, who Saber fans unfortunately know very well. So Creighton will have to have th- their eyes peeled for both of those two guys because they're going to be leading the show tonight for Wisconsin for sure. Mm-hmm. Or not tonight, I'm sorry, Wednesday or Tuesday. Yes. Whenever that game's going on. That would be uh, Tim Brando and Jim Jackson on the call. Yes. So the four big guys are getting work tomorrow. Yep, so they're bringing out the uh, – which is good. I mean, they should, you know? Yeah, they should. Um, so Wednesday, the only game of the night is Butler Northwestern, which, you know, I wasn't super high on because they played the last two seasons, but it's a better Northwestern team in the last couple of years, aside from the loss of um, Alex Ola. Yep. So it should be interesting. Um, I don't really like to ever – pick against Butler at Hinkle, especially in non-conference play? No, I, I certainly would advise against that. I would think that Butler is probably going to win. They may have their early struggles again like they did against Northern Colorado, but I think that you know they're going to eventually pull away and take down the Wildcats. Yeah, and then you know if Butler takes care of business that game, the next game they go to uh, Vegas Thanksgiving night and play Vanderbilt, and then if they win, they get a pretty intriguing matchup with uh, Arizona, likely. Yeah. Or St. Mary's. Or is it St. Mary's or Santa Clara? Um, Santa Clara. I think it's Santa Clara. So, yeah. I mean, probably Butler, Arizona, or if they play Santa Clara, you know, pick up a victory. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Thursday night, obviously the biggest game is DePaul Rutgers. <laughs> um, no, but DePaul Rutgers, you know, it is what it is. They're two teams that are – you know, not the best. And you'd rather see that than you'd see Rutgers play, you know, Georgetown or something, Seton Hall, which happens anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you'd rather see that than have DePaul play, you know, Indiana or something. Yeah. Um, also, Thursday, like we talked about earlier, a couple of afternoon games. Uh, Villanova opens the Charleston Classic at uh, like 11.30 in the morning. Does that sound right? Yes, yes. eleven thirty yes. in the morning against Western Michigan. Uh, so not a whole bunch to talk about there. Not a whole bunch to talk about in the whole Charleston Classic for Villanova. Nope, that should be a yeah, that should be a victory for them. They should be able to take care of business out there unless something dramatic happens. And then, like we've talked about a lot, also Xavier plays Mizzou earlier in the day. Mm-hmm. In the, uh, Puerto Lando Classic. Yes. Um, you know, Mizzou's not very good. They beat Alabama A&M by a million last night, but yeah. Alabama A&M is also not very good. No, not very good at all. So the games that are actually good on Thursday night, we talked about Providence, Ohio State. Um, it's intriguing. You know, I want to see what Providence does tonight. I think Ohio State still don't know how good they are, but they – pulled away from Navy after having some struggles in the first half. But, you know, it's it's hard to talk about Providence when we haven't seen them yet. Exactly. So we'll be able to make an assessment on what we expect from the Friars against Ohio State after they played tonight. Yes. And uh, a dark horse contender for best Gavit game, Seton Hall going to Iowa City. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to see the Pirates play the uh, the Hawkeyes out there. That should be a pretty fun one, considering how well Seton Hall's started off their year. And, you know, Iowa has tended to be a threat, and it's never really easy to go on the road and win. Of course, Iowa last year dominated their Gavit game against Marquette, so they're looking to go 2-0 and in the Gavit games. Yeah, I mean, both teams have beat the stuffing out of bad teams so far. Yeah. Uh, I would beat Kennesaw State and Savannah State. Seton Hall obviously beat fairly different Dickinson and Central Connecticut. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, you know, Carver's one of those underrated, sneaky, hard places to play. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Iowa, obviously, different team than last year. They don't have um, 
Don't have Jared Udoff anymore. Don't have Mike Giselle anymore. Don't have Anthony Clemens, Adam Woodbury, but uh, – Still have jokes, still have Yule. So yeah. there's yeah. still there's still plenty of talent there. Still have talent. Fran McCaffrey is a pretty good coach. Um, yeah. So it'll be a good game. Um, you know, it's a nice test for – Seton Hall before they go into a sneaky hard uh, whatever tournament they're in with Florida and Gonzaga field. Yep, I believe that that is the. Uh, I don't think it's. I don't know if it's the Paradise Jam. I think they were in that a few years ago. No, it's in Orlando. It's um. Ad, I want to say it's Advocare. Yeah, it's the Advocare Invitational. It's the thing that Xavier won. Yeah, yeah, and actually, a Seton Hall Gonzaga rematch would be a lot of fun because you know Gonzaga has those. Uh, Two guys, well, the one guy in Kyle Wilcher, who's a real pest, he's yeah. gone. But um, the one big guy that they had a couple of years ago, what is his name? Karnowski. Yeah. He's good. And Nigel Williams Gus is pretty good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we talked, and that's something we talked about with Russ if you listen to the uh, national preview podcast. Gonzaga's got a lot of talent. So, you know, if. Uh, Seen how runs into them again down the line. It should be a good game again. And then Michigan, with their second test of the year, or uh, Marquette, actually, with their second test of the year against Michigan, also yeah. Thursday night. And, uh, you know, I still think Marquette needs to win, like I said earlier, either against Michigan or Pitt or SMU. You know, if you go and you win both, like last year, great. But you need one. Yeah. And I think, I think that they have a chance to get it. No, oh, me too. Um, I think Michigan's a very good team, obviously, with, uh, you know, guys like Zach Irvin. And uh, Derek Walton's pretty good. Yep, they still have those guys. Um, they've been around for you know, the championship teams, but now they're here with a team that's a little bit in transition. But still has some talent there. They'll be they'll quite an interesting matchup for Marquette. Yeah, I, I think Pitt and SMU are both quite beatable. Yes, I would agree with that as well. So, you know. I think if they get past Michigan, I think that they can, you know, get past SMU and Pitt. Pitt actually struggled pretty mightily with Eastern Michigan. So, yeah. Yes, signs, signs definitely point to a positive trip to New York for Marquette, for sure. So then Friday, I think we just have to talk about the games that uh, we know for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, Villanova's going to be playing again. Xavier's going to be playing again, probably against Clemson, I believe we determined. Yeah, I, th- I, think, that, I think that sounds right. Um, but, yeah, the last couple Gavit games on Friday night, you got Minnesota and St. John's, which, you know, probably the least – Desirable matchup of the entire tournament. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's ever really gotten excited about a Minnesota basketball game. But, you know, again, evenly matched would be a nice win for St. John's to go on the road. and Because uh, they should be 2-0 and going into that game. You know, they should win tonight. and You know. Yep. And then uh, Creighton plays Washington State. They should roll them. Washington State's one of the five worst power conference teams. And I uh, believe that's it. Yeah, I believe that that's it as well. For Friday. Um, Saturday, it's a light schedule. Um, I would imagine Villanova and Xavier don't play three days in a row. They'd probably play Sunday. Uh, Butler plays Bucknell at home. You know. Should be a win. Providence plays Grambling State at home, so two victories for the Big East there. Yes. And then, like I said, Sunday, some teams will probably play, those teams that are in those tournaments. And the one game that's on the schedule already is – is there games? I think you would have to you know wait on the tournaments to see how they play out. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if there's any games necessarily scheduled for Sunday at the moment. Um, gonna check real quick. 
Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Um, yeah, actually, Creighton plays either Montana or NC State because that'd be the second game of the Paradise Jam. Um, so, you know, if it's NC State, real interesting matchup to watch between uh, Dennis Smith and uh, Maurice Watson. But, yeah, Sunday, DePaul plays Milwaukee. Milwaukee lost a ton of players from last year, including their head coach. Yep. Villanova and Xavier will probably both be in the championship of their tournaments. So, that'll do it for the week. A lot going on. Yeah. Fun. Uh, um, all right. Listen to us talk long enough. Let's get some questions going. Yep. You want to pull those up or you want me to do it? I'll take care of it. Okay. Oh, just real quick. Do you know who is the Big East active leading scorer in terms of total points? I don't think you're going to get it. No, I don't. Who well, is it? Billy Garrett. Huh. I guess that makes sense in theory. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was surprised when they showed it last night, though, on the uh, DePaul game. When did we start kicking questions so I know how far I need to look back? Uh, yesterday, I think. Okay, yeah. Um, first question is from Jake Nazar from and An- the Valley Shook, formerly of Testudo Times as well. How many Georgetown players' ankles is Mel Trimble going to break on Tuesday? A lot or all of them? <laughs> Like I said earlier, you know, Trimble's Trimble's going to do his thing against Georgetown, probably. Um, so probably probably a lot. I would wager a lot. <laughs> I would wager a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's see. Going up here, let's see if we can find more. Um, yep, okay, next question from Andrew Cresson. Does Creighton have a chance? I think, you know, they uh, any, any team has a you know, puncher's chance of being anybody, uh, Wisconsin will provide you know pretty a pretty tough matchup for them. But I think considering the game is at CenturyLink Center, it kind of does lean their way. But I would I would pick the Badgers, but I wouldn't be you know totally stunned if they did pull off the upset. No, neither. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's not like last year when they had to go to Assembly Hall. No, definitely not. All right. No, it's, it's like we said earlier with Creighton, you know, a solid veteran core going up against another solid veteran core. Okay, next question from our pals at Rumble in the Garden. Rumble in the Garden, rather. Will anyone watch a Friday night game at Minnesota? <sighs> uh, definition of anyone, because we'll obviously be watching because we have to, but... Yeah, um, you know... I think people Minnesota always seems to have nice attendance, regardless of the fact that the team hasn't been good ever. Yeah, they definitely get a lot of good attendance at the barn. I don't think it's an exaggeration either. They have the tournament drought right up there with Northwestern. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you know. And, you know, it's an early enough game where you can watch it and then still go out. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, next question from Jacob Padilla. Uh, how do you see Creighton matching up defensively against Wisconsin's Hayes Brain Hayes Brown hat front line? Um, that could be troubling. Yeah, I mean, just trying to see real quick who Creighton started the other night. Um, yeah, I can't find it. But no, I mean. You know, we've we've talked about it a lot. It's going to be hard to go up against those guys regardless of your personnel. I mean, they're all very good, very smart players. For the record, they they started Thomas Patton Huff at the in the uh, their front court. I I don't know if I would love starting Patton just because he's you know one game into his college career. Yeah, but um, obviously his size no. will allow probably allow him to though. Yeah. 
I mean, maybe throw him out there, see if he can give you something, and then if he can't, make change on the fly. Yep, probably throw Zach Hansen out there just if they need to. But I think the, you know Wisconsin does have a pretty significant edge, I would say, there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing to note, and it might just be an anomaly, uh, Central Arkansas was about 37% from long range against Wisconsin. So, so if Creighton does let it fly, then... Exactly. Exactly. All right, and last question from Pat O'Brien. What's the most important game for the respective teams? Nova versus Purdue is big time, but might other games mean more to who is playing? Uh, Creighton, Wisconsin certainly is up there. Creighton can get a big win uh, to start off their season. Providence, Ohio State, uh, win on the road for the Friars for a team that's, you know, replacing a lot would certainly serve them well. And really, the same goes for Seton Hall versus Iowa. Yeah. Which would do well for them. Yeah. Georgetown, Maryland is a big one. Yeah. You know, obviously, the rivalry implications plus, you know, to be 3-0 and going into Maui, assuming Georgetown doesn't suffer a letdown against uh, whatever not great team, the Arkansas State on Thursday night, uh, that's big because that's a loaded Maui field. Suddenly you're not necessarily in a position where you need to go three and Oh, I mean, you'd like to, you'd like to have a winning record down there, but if you don't, you know, you come home at, you know, let's say three and two, I don't think they're going to go zero and three in Maui. Yep. And you know, that it's not exactly what you want, but I feel like there's less pressure if they beat Maryland to, you know, perform super well in Maui, where if you go to Maui Monday and you do knock off Oregon, suddenly, you know, you're 4-0, you beat two pretty good teams, you're starting to feel pretty good. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I think Georgetown is probably the, uh, the um, what was the wording? Important. Important. Yeah, so I think that's probably your most important one, but that's just that's just from my view. Exactly. Yeah. So, I believe that's it. I believe so as well. You know, we got about uh, four hours or so until these games start tonight. Mm-hmm. Three hours. Three hours, because uh, St. John's is the 6.30 start, which I really like. I like yes. doing that did it. Um, so, yeah. You know, we live tweeting in games. Probably most – or I mean, St. John's at first, and then it'll it'll probably end up being mostly Villanova-Purdue. You know, it's always hard with the live tweeting when there's a bunch of games on because we want to follow them all. But when there's a clear best matchup, you know. Yep, exactly. Do what you got to do. All right. So that'll do it. Um, we will be back next Monday to preview Feast Week. Um, some pretty cool games there. So, yep. yeah. So that's Chris. I'm Rob. Thank you for uh, reading Big East Coast Bias. Thank you for listening to the podcast, and we will see you later.